Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Tara Alvarez. Uh, she's a professor of biomedical engineering at New Jersey Institute of Technology. And we're going to talk about her research. So thank you for coming, Tara. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me, Richard. It's absolutely my pleasure. Well, good. Well, tell me about your research. What are you focusing on? So what gets me up in the morning is I am fascinated with how the brain can change really at any age. And in particular, I'm interested in what is called vision therapy and how vision therapy can change the brain. And you might ask, well, what is vision therapy and why do I care about brain changes? But about 5% of the general population has a binocular vision problem known as convergence insufficiency. And what that means is that people have a hard time moving their eyes together or coordinating them. And they all, um, doctors huh. sometimes refer to this as a teaming problem. Like one eye will lag the other eye? Will it look like a lazy eye or what do you mean? Uh, it's not the same as lazy eye, which is called strabismus, and that can lead to amblyopia, where you basically the brain shuts down one visual pathway. But it's similar in the sense that this has an impact on how you do near work. And what I mean by that is your ability to read comfortably. And in the days of COVID and the pandemic, that is being able to work on a computer comfortably, whether you're a child doing virtual school or professional working from home. I heard that uh, people that look at screens, their blink rate slows down and, um, you know, the the lubrication system for their eye can sometimes get gunked up if they look at screens for too long. Exactly. And some people are referring to this as digital eye strain. And what happens is if you're so concentrated on the screen, sometimes you don't blink and you need to blink in order to clean the eye and not get so tired. And in addition to that, people have a, some people, it's 5% of the general population, and then it's half of the people that have had a concussion where they have persistent symptoms. These are the people that after one to three months, they still have vision problems. And in terms of what these people experience, when they look um, at a computer screen or they read for a while, their um, the text starts to get blurry, it starts to double they see things floating on the page. They have to reread. Um, and as you can imagine, this has a really negative impact on kids learning in school and professionals trying to work from home. Okay. So are you studying uh, how it happens or how to treat it or what's the focus? Um, so we're studying how to treat it. And the good news is my 
main clinical collaborator, that's Dr. Scheinman. He's an optometrist and a PhD. He has led um, randomized clinical trials to show that vision therapy is indeed effective in about 73% of children. I replicated that study in young adults. Those are people 18 to 35 years old and also found that. But the unique part of my work is that we're also studying how the eyes move and how the brain triggers these type of eye movements. And you may want to think about how a baseball batter watches a fastball coming towards them. That is how you see in depth. And it's also called um, convergence. And if that is messed up, you're not going to be able to track targets that well. And just like somebody could go to physical or occupational therapy, if they've had some type of an injury and they need to have a therapist help them regain that functionality, whether it was a car accident, a stroke, a sporting injury, vision therapists help repair or improve the way in which you coordinate your eyes. What's involved in the therapy? I'm sorry to interrupt you. What's involved in the therapy? What are the steps and how does it work? So it's repetitive eye movement exercises. And I'm also the chief scientific officer on a startup company that I founded with Dr. Chiman, who's the chief medical officer, and two of my student alumni, John Vito D'Antonio Bertinoli, who's the CEO, and Chief Yarama, uh, Chang Yaramalto, who's the chief technical officer. And we are creating virtual reality games. So that basically you're doing these exercises over and over and over again. So you're basically like tracking a ball in um, a headset and this will improve your coordination, just like going to a batting cage and practicing over and over and over again will improve your, your hit rate. We're also improving how you can see things and we give people targets to look at that come on midline. Again, just how a fastball comes to you and they have uh, letters on the spheres. Now, vision therapy is quite a mature field in that it's been around from the um, 50s and 60s, but it is quite boring. And if you try to do this at home, a lot of people just don't do it because it's so boring and that's you know poor patient compliance. And we're hoping with our virtual reality games that children and young adults, um, or even older adults for that matter, because this is also common in people with Parkinson's disease, they are just having fun. But in actuality, we would be improving their binocular coordination and improving how the brain um, sends signals down to the um, muscles that control the eyes. So what happens, so you talked about reading, you said after a while, whether reading on a screen or mm-hmm. maybe a book, you know, things look blurry and cross over. What about driving? Are they able yes. to drive at night? Do they have problems there? Like what are their major areas of their life are impacted because of this? So it's anything where you're doing sustained near vision. So driving isn't impacted as much because you tend to be looking further away while you're driving. But if you're looking down at your dashboard, um, that could be you know more challenging for people with this binocular vision dysfunction. Uh, and where you really see it is when people are you know working um, something that's like a little bit less than an arm's length away. So that's reading their smartphones, that's working on a tablet, working on a computer, reading a book, all of those tasks. So for example, in the general population, after maybe 15, 20 minutes, uh, people need to take a physical break and look at something in the distance because they'll get headaches, they'll get pulling around their eyes, eye strain. Uh, For concussed patients where their symptoms persist, this can happen in just a few minutes. And this is also true. We're also studying with Dr. Quinn with the University of New Mexico and the Albuquerque Veterans Association, the VA, how veterans that have come back who have been exposed to blast injuries, they also very commonly have this vision problem and they have a difficult time also doing anything at near. So we are trying to study um, vision therapy in that group as well. Does it matter the underlying condition of the person's eyes before the trauma? You know, if someone was nearsighted already, or far-sighted, they had bifocals, or they had perfect vision, what happens to them? Before we continue, 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Excellent question. So I just wrapped up a um, National Institutes of Health. That's part of our federal tax dollars. Um, part of our government money goes to the NIH, National Institutes of Health. And then professors like me write grant proposals to compete for that money. And I just finished up a study on typically occurring convergence insufficiency. So that's people without head trauma that just have this because their binocular vision system didn't normally develop the way it was supposed to. And I just got funded for the next five years to study this vision dysfunction in people with persistent concussion. And one of the key things that we're going to do within the next five years is to study, does it make a difference if it was because of something going wrong with the developmental process, or if it was an injury. And we will be looking at whether or not it's a sporting injury versus a fall versus, um, you know, a car accident, and how many times they've had a concussion. So it's an excellent question. And if you call me back in five years, I'll be able to answer it. Yeah. How soon after a traumatic event do people seek help versus when they need help? How quickly? Excellent question. And it depends on part of what I'm doing is I'm working with Dr. Tina Masters, who's the director of concussion at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I'm also working with Dr. Arlene Goodman, who is the director of concussion at Somerset Pediatric Group, which is part of the Robert Wood Johnson Rutgers uh, system. And not all concussion doctors or sports medicine doctors Um, have best practices in this field, which is why it's one of the core areas that I'm researching because there's a need for it. And currently, we don't have quantitative measurements, meaning many of these concussion doctors are relying on a patient's symptoms. And one of the things we're hoping to do at the end of this five-year grant is to begin to develop best practices um, that will help concussion doctors in their management of the patient's diseases um, and dysfunctions in their visual system. So it depends on who you get in terms of a doctor. So if some of the doctors are very well-versed in vision dysfunctions, some of them work directly with optometrists or ophthalmologists. And if the uh, concussion patient is having an issue, they'll refer them to somebody who has a specialization in vision, but not all doctors do that. So it really depends on where you go. And this is one of the things that's important from a public health standpoint for us to educate the public more about. What have you seen clinically? Who does better? You know, younger versus older, are there certain traumas that are more amenable to therapy that work better? You know, repeated traumas, do they lock in these problems? So the group we have not studied yet is the older adults. Those are people that are 35 and older. We've studied pediatrics, so that's 9 to 17 years old, and we've studied 18 to 35. Um, and those groups did not have brain injury. And in those groups, about 75% reach vision function where they would be considered quote unquote cured, or their vision parameters would be the same as somebody that had normal binocular vision. It is true that if you had ADHD, if you have ADHD, that's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADD, attention deficit disorder, it's a bit harder to rehabilitate that group. And that makes sense to us. One of my colleagues, Dr. Shaibo Lee, studies ADHD. And a lot of the attention network overlaps with the vision network. So there's a very high comorbidity between those two problems. And sometimes 
a child might get misdiagnosed with ADHD when they actually have a vision disorder. And again, it depends on which doctor they're seeing. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. What does that mean, comorbidity? Does that mean people that have ADHD, when they get concussions and all that, they have worse problems or they can't rehab or what's the interaction? So comorbidity means that you have two things at the same time. So with the concussion patients, we do have some preliminary data that shows that we can rehabilitate them. But what we actually just started on September 1st this year, um, we're just beginning the clinical trials to really study how the brain and the eye movements and their you know, conventional vision exam changes as they go through therapy. So that data in terms of a large scale randomized clinical trial, we're beginning that this month. So I don't know how um, the concussed patients will do compared to uh, what we call typically developing CI, convergence insufficiency, which is if you know, you can get this vision dysfunction because your binocular vision just doesn't develop normally, or you can get it because you got into, you know, an accident. And the question is, are they the same thing or are they different? And we have data to suggest that they're different because people that have had concussions also commonly report that they're dizzy. And we don't see that in the general population that just has the vision dysfunction without a concussion. Yeah, what do you think is is happening? What is the concussion doing to cause this convergence problem and dizziness, et cetera? So there's a lot of cellular work on what happens with a traumatic brain injury. And people suggest that it's due to a diffuse axonal injury. And what on earth does that mean? Well, the cells inside our brain are called neurons, and the connections between neurons are called synapses. These are how the brain cells kind of, you know, connect up to one another. And one of the theories is that with a concussion, there is this axonal injury, and it disrupts the connections between the cells. So the cells are still there. They're just not talking to each other that well. So you can imagine when we have, you know, like a hurricane and there's a tree down in the road, the road is still there, but it's much harder to get a car across it. Okay. Because there is a, you know, there's damage that's done and the, uh, we don't have data to prove this yet, but this is our hypothesis or our theory. One of the things that rehabilitation is doing is it's improving the connections between the brain cells. Is there a particular, I mean, are people like, you know, people left-handed and right-handed, are people left-eyed and right-eyed? And if they get a concussion, does it affect their, if they have a dominant eye more or, you know, a weaker eye? And do you see any difference between the eyes or a preferential, like, oh, and people with concussions, usually the right eye is more problematic for instance. Outstanding question. So just like we can be left-handed or right-handed, you can be right eye or left eye dominant, and it doesn't match. So for example, I'm right-handed, but I'm left eye dominant. And there's just as many people that are right-handed and right eye dominant. One of the papers that I did publish in um, not the concussion patients yet, but this is from the general population with the poor binocular coordination, one of the eyes was stronger. So it was doing more of the work. And that led to an imbalance between the eyes. So one eye was actually faster in terms of its um, speed or the way in which it was moving, how fast it was moving. And then after therapy, the eyes became more balanced and they started looking more similar to each other. So I don't necessarily think that if you're left eye or right eye dominant, you're more likely to have this problem. But I do, um, we do have data to show that with people with convergence insufficiency, they do have an imbalance between the eyes and therapy actually helps to strengthen the coordination so that the two eyes are more 
similar to each other in terms of the speed at which they can track a target. Again, think of that baseball batter that they're tracking the object. If a, like a baseball player has beautiful coordination, um, otherwise they wouldn't, you know, be able to hit the fastball. But if one eye was faster than the other, they would be more likely to miss the ball. When someone looks at something, does the eye just, you know, let's say there's like, I'm just going to say that like, uh, you know, the eye is going to look at whatever, an orange. Does the eye zoom in and focus and see it? Or does it, um, does it overshoot and oscillate and the oscillations get smaller and then it's able to fixate on an object? Like, how does it, how does it happen? Um, outstanding question. So my background is actually electrical engineering before I got my biomedical engineering degree. And one of my strengths in is in what is called control engineering. And just like what you're talking about, there is a pre-programmed part to the system, which is um, just, you know, like when you shoot off a missile, it's go get the target. Okay, so it's analogous to like your backhand in tennis. You just do it kind of automatically and you don't the brain doesn't spend much time thinking about it. But we also have a feedback controlled system that does have oscillations in it and it kind of, you know, zooms in and really locks in to the target. Um, Both of them are screwed up in these patients and both systems improve after rehabilitation. And I do have data to support that because what happens is for the patients um, at baseline, instead of overshooting, they go incredibly slow. So their pre-programmed system is very underdeveloped. So that, you know, burst of energy to get them to the target is just really, really wimpy. And after therapy, it's much stronger. But another thing that happens is the patients have really lousy tracking. So they oscillate a lot when they're on this target. And then after therapy, their ability to really lock in on the target and not to let it, you know, have too much error where it's, you know, too much in front or too much behind the target, really, you know, locking in on it is substantially improved after therapy. So these are outstanding questions. Um, But yes, those are things that the therapy definitely does do. Yeah, I figured there would be metrics, lock, you know, time, number of milliseconds to lock in, you know, perturbation or oscillation around locked in field of view, et cetera. Like, what are some of the metrics that you guys look for? And how do you define them? Perfect. So just to give you some, you know, course numbers, just to get everybody grounded, somebody with normal and good binocular vision, if I ask you to track a target that's, you know, on midline, or, you know, along your nose, and I ask you to look from far to near, and just like imagine, like a, you know, brain doctor saying, look at my front finger compared to look at my back finger. So look from back to forward, they will do that in about a half a second, or 500 milliseconds. But um, somebody with convergence insufficiency can take between two and four seconds. So that is four to eight times the amount of time that somebody with normal coordination will take, depending on how severe their convergence insufficiency is. And it makes sense that they're reporting double vision because their visual system is just so slow in getting their eyes there. And then speed which we look at the eyeball like a sphere, you know, a ball, and we look at degrees of rotation. So we look at how fast your eyes are moving inward or outward. You know, how fast can you go cross-eyed? And a normal binocular control, if I ask them to do what's called a four-degree movement, they should do that in about 20 to 25 degrees per second. Whereas somebody with convergence insufficiency will do that in um, maybe eight to 12 degrees per second. So they're on average anywhere between, you know, 25% to even half the level of binocular normal controls. And for people with concussion, they're even slower. And we just published that work in August this year. So when you train, do you train one eye at a time? And then you do some exercises where both eyes are working at the same time? Like you train them separately? So if you go to a 3D movie and you're given um, those glasses to wear. Oh, yeah, yeah. I hate them. They they hurt my eyes after a few seconds. Yeah, you might have a, a 
tracking problem. But the um, and it, sometimes they're very subtle, but people who hate 3D movies are more likely to have this. But what's happening there is uh, the disparity vergence system, which is what is being stimulated in the 3D movies. When I look from far to near, okay, there's actually three systems going on at the same time. And, you know, now we're going to get into some heavy duty science. So when I look from far to near, the lens inside my eye is focusing and I'm going from different distances. But in addition, I also have what's called disparity, which is the offset between the images. And people um, experience this when they do virtual reality gaming or when they go to a 3D movie and they'll see an object appear as double when they don't have the glasses on. And when they put the glasses on, the further away the double image is, the closer it's going to appear to the person. And then the other system um, is the pupil is actually adjusting the amount of light that goes into the eye. So the way therapy works, the one, the therapy that I do with Dr. Scheiman is we um, tease apart the accommodation, which is focusing and disparity vergence, which is the ability to see a single. And that's a lot. I mean, that I just okay. gave you some pretty hardcore science right there, but um, no, that's fine. some respects um, we are, what we do is we train your ability to see a single and we train your ability to see things clearly. And we train those each separately. And then we train those together. Other come along issues that, you know, let's say in people with CI problems, the pupil, for some reason, can't change size fast enough. Like what else comes along with, with this issue? So the first thing that a lot of optometrists will do is they'll do what's called a near point of convergence test, which that what that means is I take a um, like a letter E and I bring that on midline and I ask the person, when do they see it um, go blurry? And when do I see it, you know, double? That's the easiest to explain to people who are not in the field. The next thing that we do is what's called positive fusional range. And what that is, is basically your range of motion. So just like I might move my arm, um, you know, from its lowest position all the way to its highest position, and that would be my range of motion. I also have a vergence range in terms of how much I can be able to take something from double and make it single. And those are two of the most common metrics. The third is what's called FURIA, which is a little more complicated to explain. Again, is there anything else that happens in people's eyes, even rarely, that coincides with this condition or this problem that maybe points to, you know, how it happens or some of the underlying biology? So the etiology, which is why does this happen to some people and not to everyone, to be frank and blunt, um, we don't know. Uh, We don't know why some people develop this and other people do not. We assume because of the injury, um, there is some damage happening to the brain. And because the visual system takes up so much um, of the brain, it's very easy to develop a vision dysfunction after you've, you know, clunked yourself on the head and you've suffered through a concussion, especially multiple concussions. I don't know if this would be interesting or useless, but are there any blind people that have had concussions that have any effects that are strange or don't make any sense? So when we, as a scientist, we try to make our populations as similar as possible. So if you're blind, you can't have this problem because you've got a lot of other issues <laughs> that you're working on. But blind people do not have, they don't need binocular coordination because they're not bringing visual information into the brain. So that our control in terms of how we compare is we compare people with normal binocular vision to people that have um, a developmental issue. And again, we don't know why some people develop convergence insufficiency and others don't. We do know that those with attentional issues are three times more likely to have this binocular vision dysfunction. And we don't have um, solid evidence to prove it, but 
it does make sense because the vision network and the brain and the attention network share a lot of the same brain parts. Yeah, the reason why I asked it is you said a lot of the brain is devoted to visual processing. Mm -hmm. So in someone that's blind from birth that gets a concussion, I don't know, maybe their brain is reallocated to the point where they'll get different symptoms or problems or um, I don't know. I don't even know what happened. Yes, could very well happen. And then the other thing that is um, also common is some people develop difficulties um, processing sounds. That's another. um, Oh, really? What do you mean they don't? They can't. They can't identify sounds. They have more difficulty hearing all of the different sounds out there. So um, auditory problems are also common. The most common is vestibular. That means like they're they're very they get very dizzy very easy. The other ones are attentional problems, meaning they have a difficult time concentrating. Another one is they have difficulties with memory. So they feel like they're in this fog and they have a hard time, you know, also attending as well as remembering what they need to get done in life. And all of this is um, executive function. So that's more of the frontal part of the brain you know, above the eyes, um, inside the head. These are all, and then vision is one of the other most common um, complaints after a concussion that doesn't resolve or, um, and what I mean by that is that the symptoms just don't go away on their own. Well, very good. Tara, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? I have a TED Talk that they could look up that is under my name, Tara Alvarez. They can also look up my web website or my lab, and that would just be under Tara Alvarez at NJIT. And they can also look up um, our company, which is Ocular Motor Technologies, where we're trying to translate the information out of the lab um, into society. And we are trying to basically make this therapy more accessible to more people, because unfortunately, this therapy is not typically covered by health insurance. And we're trying to prove more science to show how it works so that it is covered by insurance and also to make it more cost effective where people can actually do this from the comfort of their homes. Oh, you mean they could do the training to help themselves? Yes. So it would be under the supervision of an optometrist, but they could do some of the therapy in the office with the um, vision therapist who is typically supervised by an optometrist, and then they could do some of it at home. And because you'd be doing a combination of both home as well as office-based vision therapy, we are hoping that could be more accessible to more people. Especially I'm a mom and I've got two kids. Actually, my daughter has a binocular vision dysfunction and uh, she's using our company's game right now. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's good. All right. Well, very, very good. Tara, thank you for coming on the podcast. And uh, it's an interesting phenomenon I haven't thought much about. But uh, yeah, thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you tonight. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.